So I oversee facility, finances, security, and IT, uh, which means I don't get IT, I just get IT. And uh, um, so part of my role is to sit in budget meetings and explain to them why we need to spend $40,000 on a server for more storage and why does server storage cost $40,000 and uh, why do we need to spend thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 on new laptops and uh, the, didn't we just get new laptops last year and do all those things and I just want you to know that I appreciate everybody that's in this room, the jobs you do, the fact that you're uh, often misunderstood uh, for the things that you have to advocate for. And uh, I just hope that this week has been a blessing to you, uh, that your experience here at Northwoods has been a blessing to you. And uh, I want to just take a second to tell you how proud I am of my team, of Jason Lee's leadership, of Steve McHugh and Linda Cleveland. Uh, they're our IT team. I also want you to know how proud I am of our operations team that uh, has put this together for you. Um, we have taken great pride in wanting to make this a nice event, that you can come and be blessed, that you'll uh, hear words of encouragement, that you'll get opportunities to learn and uh, uh, be better at the jobs and the roles that you fill at, at your churches. And I think it is so cool, uh, the kingdom impact that you guys represent. Um, I haven't been in all your sessions. Maybe this has already been mentioned, but when I found out that you guys represent over 500,000 in weekly attendance at the churches you serve collectively. The kingdom impact of that is huge. And so I just celebrate you, and thank you for being here. Thank you for doing what you do. And uh, we just pray the Lord's blessing on you for the rest of the day and as you, as you go home, and uh, just keep rocking it out. Now I get the privilege of introducing the, the speaker today, uh, uh, Gene Apple. Gene and I have common roots. We both grew up in Lincoln, Illinois. Uh, which is a little town about uh, 60 miles south of here. Gene's uh, uh, a couple years older than, than me, so uh, we were briefly in high school together, briefly in college together, mostly because I went one year to Bible college and they asked me not to come back, and Gene got to graduate, so uh, uh, that's how that worked. But uh, uh, I've, got, I've had the privilege of, of actually getting to observe Gene for most of my life, some of it up close as we were growing up, and, and then since we were adults from an, a distance, and every once in a while our, our paths would cross, uh, um, our family's uh, paths cross uh, from time to time as well. And uh, what I know about Gene personally that his bio doesn't tell you is that uh, he is a, a man of God that is sold out to the cause of Christ, sold out to seeing uh, souls come to Jesus Christ and to salvation, and the Lord has blessed his life immensely. But yet he is very, very humble. He doesn't wear that on his sleeve. Uh, Gene uh, started out a, as a youth minister here in Illinois. And then uh, uh, actually before that he started out his, uh, if you read his bio, he started out as an intern in California at Eastside Christian Church. Came back to Illinois as a youth minister. And uh, then he went to Henderson, Nevada and took... Uh, um, What's the name of the church in Henderson? Uh, Central. Uh, brain cramp. Took Central, and uh, they grew, grew tremendously. Uh, he left Central, went to Willow Creek, and uh, had a great run at Willow Creek. And now he's back out at Eastside in California. Kind of, it's probably felt like coming home to you a little bit, hasn't it? And uh, he started his, his uh, uh, ministry internship there and has come back. And since Gene's been at uh, Eastside, they have become one of the fastest growing churches in America. They've, they've relocated to a new campus, and uh, uh, they're just doing great, great things under his leadership. And uh, we just uh, celebrate the fact that uh, Gene's able to be with us here today. He's got a great word of encouragement to you. But I'm going to tell you something about Gene that you're not going to read anywhere else because uh, Gene doesn't talk about it. Um, but he comes from a family heritage of faith. Uh, Gene's father... Uh, Leon Apple was one of the first megachurch pastors in this country. Back in the late 60s and 70s, as a pastor at Lincoln Christian Church, they were one of only three 
churches in the independent Christian churches that were running over 1,000 on uh, average weekend service. And that was because of the uh, evangelistic fervor that his father had for seeing people come to Christ. And so Gene has come by that honestly. And uh, he comes from a, just a, a great, great heritage, a, a, a great family legacy. So uh, what we do at Northwoods when we introduce somebody, we say, let's give them a great Northwoods welcome. We do that by standing up, applauding for them. So I'm going to ask you to be Northwoods hands and feet and give Gene Apple a great Northwoods welcome to the stage. Thanks, Todd. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Todd. I really appreciate that. And uh, you have no idea uh, how honored I am and actually surprised to be asked to speak for this gathering. Uh, maybe a better word would be mystified why I was asked to speak for this gathering, uh, because anybody who knows me knows that I'm not the most tech-savvy guy in the world, and yet there's probably not a lead pastor, senior pastor uh, in the world who appreciates and respects more uh, the work of ministry IT professionals. And I was just thinking about in my own life, I mean, from the moment I get up in my day and, uh, you know, turn to my smartphone and uh, from the moment I uh, hit my laptop on and, and all the different things that I do in the course of a day, my life is completely dependent on our IT ministry at our church. And uh, all the way from conducting sermon research, from, uh, you know, just doing your... Uh, email and all the, all the simple stuff like that to making good financial decisions for the church based on information that we can trust and be able to go to sleep at night and to know that our resources are being stewarded and managed in such a way that we can trust the data that we're getting uh, on all of that. Uh, I have enormous respect for all of you and what you do. And here's what I know about your ministry. I know that when you do it flawlessly, when you do it with precision, when you do it with excellence, nobody even notices right? Uh, one thing, little thing goes wrong, everybody notices. And uh, I think it's a very special group of people who can faithfully serve without all kinds of public acknowledgement and hit the pillow at night with just the satisfaction to know that God is smiling on you going, well done, uh, good and faithful servant. You know, you made a difference with your life today. And uh, Many of you, uh, I know, have never heard me speak before, and you're like wondering right now, Gene, is that your real voice? Do you really sound that way? And, uh, you know, like I'd give, I, I'm waiting to meet the tech guru who can make me sound like Barry White when I talk. You know, I'd love to have the, you know, Jesus loves your baby or something like that. Uh, but instead, when God was handing out voices, I got one that sounds like I've been inhaling helium for four days. Uh, so that's kind of what you're stuck with this morning. Hey, I was born in 1960. So I've lived through the entire decades of the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, first two decades now of the new millennium that we were in. And uh, just in the years that I've been alive, I have seen so much change in our world and in my life. Uh, I've watched in my lifetime human beings go to the moon for the first time. I've watched, you know, uh, computers the size of this room get shrunk down to the size of our smartphones. Uh, I remember the first world heart transplant when it happened in the world. I mean, you know, I, uh, I remember even life before post-it notes. Uh, what, what, I don't know how we did life before post-it notes. And uh, I was down in uh, Lincoln just uh, an hour south of here the last uh, day and a half visiting my mom. My mom was born in 1923. She's 91 years old, doing great now. But, but I was just thinking about all the change that she's gone through in her lifetime. And she remembers life before there was electricity and plumbing and and telephones, and TVs in every home, and uh, now she's 91, you know, and she's on her, uh, you know, laptop at home, uh, uh, you know, on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, you know, it's just incredible. Those of you who've traveled in third world countries know that you can't go anywhere. You may go to a third world country today, and you'll find people that don't have food, and they don't have a home to live in, and they don't have clothes on their back, but they have a phone. And technology has just completely changed our world. It's incredible, the communication we have anywhere, anytime. It was Heraclitus who said 2,600 years ago, he said, life is like a river, it's in a continual state of change. He said, you can put your foot into the river, and he said, you take your foot out of the river, and when you put your foot back into the river, it's a different river because the river has moved on. 
life is in a continual state of change. Now, we have a lot of fears. We have a lot of phobias in life. Uh, I heard one time, you know, the number one fear, uh, most common phobia that people have is the fear of public speaking. Uh, number two fear is the fear of death. You think about that, death is number two. Uh, number three is fear of death while public speaking. And uh, <laughs> I've done that many times. But I think if there's uh, like a big fear that a lot of people have in life, it's the fear of change. It's just the fear of change. My wife Barbara and I will celebrate our 22nd wedding anniversary this January, and uh, from the day Barbara and I got married, my life changed, and Barbara initiated several non-sanctioned changes in my life. For instance, when we got married, uh, she changed my soap, and uh, I had always been, for years and years and years, a gold dial soap guy. I mean, that is a manly soap, right? That is, you know, a good, strong deodorant soap, gold dial soap. And she changed my soap. And I would like to say that I was cool about it. And, you know, I, I accepted the change. But I griped, I moaned, I complained. And I'm embarrassed to admit this, especially with so many guys in the room today. But for the last nearly 22 years, my soap has been caress. <laughs> but my skin is silky smooth. <laughs> so change is always a hard thing, but change can be a good thing. And I think if there's one word that describes the life of IT professionals in the church, it's change. You are trafficking in an era of ministry that is always changing. And you know, churches are in the business of life change, so at the end of the day, your ministry is all about supporting lives that are changing. People who are on the road to hell, who are now on the road to heaven, that's what you do. But with technology always in motion, always advancing, you have to lead and implement changes in a church culture that is typically resistant to technological change. How many of you noticed that in, in your environment that you're in? Uh, I began my ministry that I'm in now at Eastside Christian Church uh, in Anaheim, California. We were in Fullerton at the time. We relocated a couple years ago. I began there October 1st, 2008. So I've been there just over six years now. And from a technological standpoint, when I arrived at the church, the church was firmly planted in the 1980s. We have 20 slide projectors, if any of you are looking for any, that I'd be glad to, to donate to your, to your ministry. And our, our technology, our systems, our software were abysmal. I had been at the church for several months and uh, hired a new administrative assistant that I had worked with before, and on her first day in the office, she walked in and she brought her personal laptop with her, and she flipped it up, and uh, she started kind of looking for a signal, and, and she said to me, she said, I, I can't. I don't, I don't see the, the signal here. I don't see the signal. I said, Marge, welcome to Eastside. We had no Wi-Fi. I mean, we'd barely just had, I think, you know, dial-up for a few months at that point. And so we were very, very uh, technologically challenged. Several months later, we added the church's first uh, technology officer. And if there's one word to describe his ministry at Eastside over the last five and a half years now, it's change, change. Did you ever have the introduction of an IT change initiative in a church uh, environment that went bad? One or two of you? Uh, people weren't prepared for the change. They didn't embrace the change. Uh, when you talk about change, you ever had people whose their, their eyes just glaze over? You walk in the room, you know, and this is the new thing. Or worse yet, have you had senior leaders or lead pastors, senior pastors like me disparaging your efforts to try to make ministry better in your environment? So what went wrong? Seldom do we ever stop to analyze, why did this new uh, thing that we tried to initiate, well, why did it go bad? And so I want to save you from some frustration, and I'm going to kind of do two segments to my talk today. I want to do kind of some, some things that I hope will be some good information for you, and then I want to spend some time on what I hope will be some good inspiration for you. Uh, I want to save you some time, some frustration, by identifying for you some of, the common most, some of the most common mistakes that happen when we introduce a change initiative into a church environment, and it goes bad. Because some of the greatest learnings we can learn about are you know, uh, what went wrong? Why didn't that work? And so let me just share with you five or six of the most common mistakes that I see being made, not just in IT areas, but in, in church in general when, when changes are initiated. Mistake number one 
is naively assuming that churches are as receptive to change as any other organization or business in the world. Now, while that should be true, while we wish that was true, the reality is it's just the opposite I have found in churches. Churches tend to be the most change-resistant culture uh, on planet Earth. I mean, what frustrated IT professional hasn't said, you know, when they hired me, they said they were open to change and they were willing to change and they wanted to take their technology to a new level and everybody was on board with change until we actually changed something. And now there's all kinds of contention in our midst. Why are churches more change resistant than other organizations? I think because in a world that is constantly changing so rapidly, churches see themselves as tradition keepers. Churches see themselves as preservers of the past. Churches tend to be, unfortunately, more resistant to change than any other organization. I think people want their church to be kind of a bastion of relief in a world that is constantly changing. It's very naive to assume that just your culture is going to be receptive to change because technology is changing. Here's a second one, and this is a huge one. In fact, this, if I shared only one thing with you today on mistakes, this is probably the one I would choose to share with you. Neglecting to sell the problem first. Neglecting to sell the problem first. People have to be convinced there's a problem before there's any urgency to change anything. What's the most common motivator that leads people to make a change in their life? It's pain, right? It's, it's discomfort. It, 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 it's fear. Ken Holtman says in his book, Managing Transitions, he says, most managers and leaders put 10% of their energy into selling the problem and 90% into selling the solution to the problem. He says, people aren't in the market for solutions to problems they don't see, acknowledge, and understand. They might even come up with a better solution than yours, and then they won't have to sell it. It will be theirs. You understand what that's saying? If you want to introduce something new in a culture, help people understand there's a problem that has to be addressed and how that change is going to address uh, that. Last, last uh, January, just this past year, January 2014, we went from a Google-based email-driven uh, system. I, I'm, see, I'm already talking over my head. I don't even know what I'm talking about right now. Thank you. To Microsoft 365. And uh, it had kind of been announced at a staff meeting in November or December that that was going to come in January. And, and a couple months went by, and it was like the second or third week of December. And all of a sudden, one day... Everything changed from this Google system to Microsoft 365, and all hell broke loose. Nobody knew it was coming. I mean, it had been like vaguely mentioned at a meeting a couple months earlier. Nobody had been prepared. Nobody understood why we were making the change. Nobody understood what was the value of the new system that was uh, going to happen. It was not fully understood what were some of the things that we were going to be giving up in the old system. And all I can say is after six months, we went back to our old Google system. Yeah, I, I was happy. I was happy. And I don't know that, you know, it, the, the problem with the change was maybe not that that Microsoft 365 wasn't the right choice for our environment and some of the challenges, our people were just not prepared for the change. They didn't understand that there was going to be a, a problem that was going to be addressed. Here's mistake number three in why change initiatives sometimes go bad. It's neglecting to understand the emotions of change. And I know typically IT people don't deal in the emotional world too much, okay? But in your culture, uh, I can guarantee you that when you are initiating some of your new technologies that you're doing, you're going to have all kinds of people who respond to that change differently. Uh, a friend of mine and I wrote a book a decade ago called How to Change Your Church Without Killing It. And one of the things that we discovered was uh, that people respond differently emo emotionally to change. Let me tell you about some of the different groups. You're going to have a small group, maybe 2 to 4% of your team, your staff, your leaders in your church that you might call the creators. These are the people who love new ideas. They love risk. In fact, if there's not risk involved, uh, they're probably uh, not interested in that. The, uh, the, so on the positive side, they're always bringing new creative ideas. On the negative side, uh, they like an idea simply because it's new, not necessarily because it's a good idea, okay? 
So that's the creators. A second group in every church who responds to change a little differently, and this is probably 12 to 25% of those on your team, are the progressives. And the progressives are people who love new ideas. They love to be creative, but they also want ideas that are workable. But most importantly, the progressives are the people within your church culture who will influence the, the rest. People tend to look at a progressive and they say, hey, if they tend to be on board, then I ought to be on board too. If they think that's a good thing, then maybe I ought to think that's a good thing too. And then there's a third group, and we call these the builders. These might be 25 to 40% of your team. And uh, builders are good planners. When they hear a new idea or a good idea, they usually say, now, how is that going to, to work? And builders can kind of get caught up in the details, and they lose the big picture. They might ask some good questions, and generally their questions can make an idea a little better. Now, because we wrote our book that we, when we wrote How to Change Your Church Without Killing It to be used by church leaders, we really struggled how to identify the next two groups of people in the average church because we didn't want to be... Uh, too derogatory or negative when we describe them. And uh, so we chose to call the fourth group the foundationals. And the foundationals might be 20 to 40% of your team. And on the positive side, your foundationals help you appreciate your past. They help you uh, uh, appreciate where you've been. But they tend to, on the negative side, they tend to be uh, wilderness wanderers rather than those ready to go into the promised land. And then the last group, and again, we struggled to how to describe this group, we call the anchors. That, that, doesn't that sound positive? They're anchors. And uh, anchors make up maybe 10 to 20% of your team. Anchors help you retain the good of your heritage. They can be a retention wall to show you where you've been. Anchors tend to help us really think through process as well. But anchors can be negative and fearful, and anchors will ultimately die in the wilderness because they are not changing. Now, if you don't understand you've got these different groups on your ministry team, you're going to be surprised when like things are going real well with this team over here, or this person over here, others are you know, real negative over here. There, there's different emotions that are going to respond to uh, technology. And, and just kind of an, an insight here, the progressives on your team, the people that others look to to say, hey, if they're on board, I ought to be on board too, they are the single most important group that you can get to embrace new technology initiatives when you're doing it. Because one of the things I've always said, it's not how many people embrace the change, it's who embraces the change that determines whether it's going to be a success or a failure. And so when you get the right people embracing it, everybody else uh, will, will embrace it too. Okay, uh, mistake number four. Launching without a supportive lead pastor or executive team. If you're doing a major uh, technology change. A show of hands, let me just ask, I want to be clear about something. How many of you in this room are not senior pastors or lead pastors? Yeah, that's exactly what, what I thought. And uh, uh, be sure to catch this. If, if you're trying, if you're all charged up about a new big major technology initiative in your ministry and your senior team is not fully embracing it, or your lead pastor is not going to put their endorsement behind that, uh, be careful, because one of the things that we found in our research for our book on leading through change is that without that kind of support, you have nearly a 100% chance of failure in, in your change initiative. So uh, if you, you, all of you know what it's like to, to be in charge of implementing you know, new systems, new technology, new hardware, new software, uh, new databases, those kinds of things. And if you don't have full organization, because you don't have organizational authority, you have to lead by relational equity, and uh, so, so you're going to need that. Here's a, one other mistake uh, common made, focusing on the change instead of the transition. Now hear that, focusing on the change instead of the transition. In his work, Making the Transition, a guy by the name of William Bridges says, it's not the change that gets you, it's the transition. It's not what you're trying to do. It's that process, that transition of getting there that can make or break the process. One pastor, uh, I heard about years ago, old, old joke, you know, about a guy serving in a very traditional church. And the pastor said, I am going to move the piano from this side of the auditorium to that side of the auditorium if it's the last thing I do. And sure enough, it was the last thing that he did. 
and it created a big uproar in the church. He loses his job over it, big, big fiasco. A year later, he comes back, and he and his wife are visiting the church and notices on Sunday morning the piano's been moved from that side of the auditorium to that side of the auditorium. And he goes to the new pastor, and he said, man, that's amazing. How did that happen? He, he said, I lost my job over that. And the new pastor said, well, it was very easy. I just moved it one inch every week. You see, it's not the change that gets you. It, 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 it's, not the, it's the transition that really matters. You not only need a change plan when you're initiating new things, you need a transition plan. You say, well, what's the difference by that? Change focuses on where you're going. Transition fo- helps you remember where you are right now. Change plans focuses on the resources, the structures that are going to be needed. Transition plans help you take people into account, the history, the church, the culture into account. Change plans focus on mind and logic. Doesn't this make sense? Everybody can see this. Transition plans take into account hearts and feelings. Change plans take risk and boldness. Transition plans take patience and timing. We went to, uh, so, so last January, we initiated that changeover from Google to uh, the Microsoft 365, and, and we had that whole debacle. And then we were all set in March to go to a completely new database management system. I won't say which system we left and which system we, we went to, because I know there's a lot of different strong emotions about those things in this room. So, uh, But we were going through that change, and it was really interesting to watch how our IT team learned from the... Google Microsoft 365 fiasco and how much better when we started to make. We had bringing key leaders together for all kinds of meetings about the new database system, speaking into that, all staff training mandatory for several days, weekly troubleshooting meetings that were going on after that, and and the process has just been so much better. What was the difference? In one case, on the you know Microsoft 365 deal, A change was made without a transition plan. On this database system, a change was made with a good transition plan, and it's made all the difference in the world. Okay, last mistake that I want to hit on. Over-accelerating the pace of change. Ask any psychologist, and he or she will tell you, that uh, all change is stressful. If you don't believe that, go down and spend an hour in your church nursery this weekend. They do a lot of changing in there, and it's stressful in there. Psychologist, uh, I, uh, I remember when I was in Psychology 101 in, co- in college, talked about the uh, guy went up on the chalkboard and he wrote down LCU, which stood for Life Change Unit. And when a person gets too many life change units going on in their life, you know how this is. You're moving, new job, you know, big financial change, you get married, there's a death, there's a divorce, you know, new kids. Uh, stress goes up. And the more life change units you get going on at any one time, you can go on overload and it can lead to all kinds of physical problems, headaches, ulcers, high blood pressure, heart problems, because the pace of change is just too great. One of the most common mistakes in leading through any kind of changes in the church is introducing the right change at the wrong pace, doing the right thing with the wrong timing. And the general rule of thumb is the greater the enormity of the change, the more time it's going to take to transition and implement on that. Did you guys hear the story about the two entrepreneurs who decided they wanted to start a bungee jumping business down in Mexico? And they they bought the tower and they bought the core and they've got their insurance and they're setting up uh, down in a major uh, Mexico City, and a big crowd's kind of gathering around. So they got it all set up, decided to do it, a test jump. They're on top of the tower. So one of the partners, he, he jumps off and he bounces back up, and his partner sees he's got a few cuts and bruises on him. And so he, he tries to grab him, but can't get him, and he goes down again. He comes up this time, the guy's bleeding, and he can't get him this time. He goes down a third time, comes back up. He's got broken bones. He's almost unconscious. The guy's able to grab him, get him on the platform. He said, what's wrong? He said, was the cord too long? He said, no, the cord was fine. He said, but what's a pinata? (laughs) If you have ever attempted to lead through change, you know what it feels like to be that guy, to be swung at, to be, uh, you know, poked at, to be jabbed at, you know, and and you feel very underappreciated in the environment that you're in. Now, let me, I want to move from talking from kind of the information side of things to kind of the inspirational side of things for a little bit. When you're initiating... uh, 
change in your culture, you experience, I'm going to call them today the three C's, okay? Isn't that, isn't that nice? They all begin with C. Very clever, huh? So the, the first C is conflict. And it's just like I was talking about that uh, email base changeover last fall. You know, there was all kinds of conflict that took place in our culture over that. And some of you know what it's like to go through something like that where it's conflict and that's no fun. And sometimes when you're in the midst of a changeover like that, you experience the second C, which I call uh, confusion. And, and it's like, why did we do this in the first place? And, and you know, you kind of lose your courage a little bit. And, and sometimes getting from here to there is just such a challenge. So you, you did it for the right reasons. You got conflict, now you're in confusion. And then the third thing that happens, totally unrelated to the things that we're talking about right here, is in your personal life, you get some kind of crisis going on. You get something that personally crushes you. You got a, a family issue, you got an issue with one of your children, there's a health crisis, there's a financial change, there's a marriage issue, there's a death of a parent, there, there's something that's going on that just rattles you. And I know this how, how this can happen, how when you're leading through change, this can happen because it, it happened to me. In fact, uh, 25 years ago this month, I was serving uh, Central Christian Church in Las Vegas, and I was pastor there for 18 years, and I'd been there about four years at that point, and the church was kind of moving up and to the right, and good things were happening, and we dedicated a new building one night, uh, addition to our facilities. I know there's things more important than buildings, but as you all know, it's just a tool, and we really needed it. And, and the chairman of our elders got up, said some very kind things about my leadership that night, and the congregation stood and gave me a standing ovation. I'd like to say it didn't give me a big head, but that wouldn't be true. I mean, it really filled me with pride. And I, you know, it's like, I like to pat myself on the back. And I went home that night, and I went from one of the highest mountains in my life to one of the lowest valleys in my life when my wife informed me that night that she was in love and involved with another man and that she was leaving the next morning. And the next morning she did. And despite relentless attempts at reconciliation, she married the guy. And just like that, everything changed in my life. And so here we had a church that was going through lots of change, and, you know, there's conflict when you're going through change, and then sometimes you get to that point, and you say, why, why do we continue to do what we do? And, and there's confusion that's going on in that, and then you get a personal crisis that's going on in your life that absolutely crushes you. Pretty tough, pretty tough. So let me just tell you, kind of talk to you, kind of, kind of heart to heart, soul to soul for a few moments about some of the things that I learned about dealing with those three C's in my life over the years, and could we just, let's take conflict for the first one right now. And one of the things that, and we all deal with conflict in ministry, we all do. One of the things that I've learned the hard way over the years is to guard your overreactions. And that's just wise. And that's just mature when you guard your overreactions. I'll tell you something, I've been a better servant of Jesus Christ. I've been a better pastor. I've been a better leader when I've done that. I've been an insensitive jerk when I haven't. Well, I want to read for you, uh, you might just want to write this reference down. It's 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26. 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26. This is from the, uh, you say write it down, you're probably all on laptops and, you know, so uh, punch it in. And uh, in fact, you've already brought it up. You're, you're, you know, you're looking at it right now. Uh, this is from the message paraphrase of the Bible. Paul writes, God's servant must not be argumentative. Let me just stop there for a second. God's servant must not be argumentative, but a gentle listener and a teacher who keeps cool, working firmly but patiently with those who refuse to obey. You never know how or when God might sober them up with a change of heart and a turning to the truth. Isn't that good? You know, I just confess to you, in my bigger moments of immaturity, when I've overreacted to things of criticism and things like that, it has been like adding jet fuel to the fire. And it only reduces credibility. It makes us appear defensive. It makes us appear out of control. It makes us appear smaller. It is so important that we keep a Christ-like spirit and not be argumentative, but be gentle listeners 
teachers who keep cool, working firmly but patiently. Now, this is hard because all of us like to be liked, every one of us in this room. But I know the one thing that's consistent in your world is change, and you are going to be a change agent in the culture that you are in, and that means sometimes people will misunderstand you. That means sometimes people will say unkind things to you. That means sometimes people will think you're insensitive and you don't understand what they're going through. And here's a verse that ought to be on the desk of every IT ministry professional in the world, John 5.30, where Jesus says, I only try to please the one who sent me. I only try to please the one who sent me. If Jesus couldn't please everybody, why do we think we can? And I know you all have, you know, you have, a lot of you have your help desk and things like that. You want to please everybody, but you just simply can't. And here's what I want to say to you. That's okay. Guard your overreactions. It's wise. It's mature. Sometimes when you're going through conflict and you're dealing with that confusion thing, you know, and you're like, you start to lose courage. Why, why am I doing? What am I doing? And why am I in ministry in the first place? And why did I think the church world be, would be any different than the business world or whatever world, uh, financial world that you came out of or what, whatever, a lot of you came out of a different world before you got into church ministry. And this is where, like when I go through times like that, I have to re-clarify in my mind why I do what I do. And sometimes we just have to have those moments where we re-clarify re in our minds. There was a few summers ago, I was going on a summer break, and uh, been, we'd been navigating a lot of change as a church and as a ministry and, and trying to be more intentional about reaching people who are far from God and the people Jesus misses most. And I was under the gun, and I was going through, you know, experiencing a lot of that conflict and stuff like that. And personally, I was, I was like confused. Why do I keep doing this? Why do I put myself through this? Why, why, do, I, why do I, you know... Uh, maybe, maybe it'd just be so much easier to just go back. Let's just keep things the same, and let, 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 let's keep it safe. And while we were on vacation that summer, we are traveling in the Midwest, and we stopped in a church one, one Sunday, and it was a very traditional church, people conservatively dressed, and, and it was kind of a small church, but the building was kind of full that day, and my family and I, we sat in the back row. And then there was a, uh, another family who came and sat in front of us. And what it looked like going on, there was mom and dad who were like uh, maybe 60-ish, and they had their adult-age children with them and some of their grandkids, maybe looked like a family reunion or something was going on. And uh, you could tell that mom was just like feeling so proud. She had her whole family in church that day. But there was one son and his girlfriend in the family. You, you could just see all the dynamics of this happening. Uh, who felt very out of place in that conservatively dressed church. They were, they were uh, kind of a biker couple. Both of them were in their Harley t-shirts and all tattooed up, you know, and they both had dreadlocks hair, and, and you could tell by looking in their eyes they had done some serious partying the night before. And just by their body language, you knew they did not want to be here. And so I just immediately started praying. It was like, God, may there be something that happens in this service today that will touch them, that will help them understand the extent you have gone to to love them. And everything about that service seemed all wrong. I mean, we got up, we sang all five verses of this 18th century hymn out, out of hymn books, and I could tell by the way that they looked at each other, they couldn't understand the words. I couldn't understand the words. It's, it's absolute truth. And then there was this woman's trio that got up and sang this chirpy little gospel song about going to heaven. I'm going to heaven or something like that, you know. And I could tell the way they looked at each other. They hadn't listened to too much trio music on their Harley lately. And my heart was breaking. Because here, were, here was a couple that desperately needed to hear the greatest message in the world. They needed to hear it in a way that they could understand it. And then the pastor got up, and I mean, the sermon was all wrong. And, and I remember walking out of that church that morning. I went out to my car, and I dropped my head on my steering wheel. And I just said, God, I am recommitting to you all over again that if that couple or anybody like them walks into a church that I serve on any given weekend, I am going to do my best to present the most important message in the world in a way that they can relate and connect with. That was an important moment for me because I had to re-clarify why I did what I do. It's not an accident that you're working in it 
church ministry environment. God had that selected for you. I mean, he numbered your days before one of them came to be. And sometimes when, you know, you're confused and things are tough, you have to go back and say, this is why I do what I do. And I'm not just in an environment because, you know, we're going to have better check-in systems for our children's ministry or we're going to have better technology to manage finances in our church and those kinds of things. We are in the life change business and ultimately at the end of the day, I get to be a part of the most important enterprise on planet Earth. Todd was mentioning that my dad was uh, a pastor. I grew up, any PKs in the room besides me? Show of hands. I have a number of you. Yeah, I, I grew up a PK. I know this sounds weird. A lot of kids grow up playing house, playing doctor. We grew up at our house playing church. And uh, I have three older sisters, and uh, they'd do a little worship team in the living room, you know. And then one of my brothers would give a prayer, and I'd give a sermon. Then we'd hit mom and dad four or five times with the offering plate before they realized what was happening. <laughs> it was a very profitable experience for us growing up. So my dad marked my life in really some incredibly positive ways, and, and uh, when I was 14 years old, we, or we have a family cabin up on the lake in Minnesota, and I'd been out fishing one Saturday afternoon with my dad and my grandfather, and we came back. Dad wasn't feeling well that night, and, and uh, had to take him to the little local hospital, Park Rapids, Minnesota, population 2,400. You can imagine what the hospital's like, and uh, found out that night he'd had a massive heart attack. And four days later, his condition worsened, and we had to take him to uh, the big hospital 90 miles away by ambulance in Fargo, North Dakota. And uh, so the family all went to wait for the ambulance. My brother Mike and I went back to our cabin to pack some things, and then we were going to join the rest of the family and, uh, in Fargo. And so we're back at the cabin, and hadn't been there very long, and I see my dad's best friend, familiar car, drive up the road. And I'll never forget it. He gets out of the car and he walks up to my brother Mike, puts his arm around him just like this, walks up to me, puts his arm around me just like this. And he says, boys, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news for you. He said, the good news is your daddy's gone to heaven today. The bad news is he isn't with us any longer. And just like that, my life changed. And many of you in this room, you know what it's like to go through a circumstance in your life where just like that, everything changes. So a few hours later, our family's grieving. We're packing because we live down here in Lincoln, Illinois. We're getting ready for the 700-mile trip back home to plan the funeral. And my mom asked me if I would go down the road to a little convenience store and if I would pay off our bill down there. There was a little convenience store where over the course of the summer we'd buy milk and coffee and newspapers. And this was in the old days. They would keep a tab, actually. And uh, so I said, sure. So uh, she gave me a wad of cash. And I walked down that road and... Uh, uh, I remember everything about that walk in vivid detail. I mean, I, I, it, it's like it, it happened yesterday. And I remember the tall pine trees on each side of the road. I even remember what I was wearing. I had on a pair of plaid bell bottoms with cuffs that were about this big and a maroon-colored T-shirt. I may have only been 14 years old, but I had a pretty good fashion sense about myself. And, uh, and, and you know, I've not had a lot of times in my life where I just felt like God spoke to me audibly. Certainly every day I, I sense his leadings and those kinds of things, but I sense God spoke to me that day. And here's what I sensed him saying. I sensed him saying, Gene, what happened to your dad today is going to happen to every single person on the face of the earth. One day is going to be their last day. And there's only one thing that matters on that day. Do they have a relationship with me? Do they have a relationship with my son, Jesus Christ? Fortunately, my dad did. I know where he's at. And I just sensed God saying, Gene, if you will put your hand in my hand, if you will trust your life to me, I'm going to use your life to help people get ready for their last day and to live every day between now and then in my love and grace. Sometimes when I get confused, sometimes when I think, why do I do what I do? Sometimes when I go home from my day of ministry, my day at the office, and the guy was just the worst day in the world. I remind myself why I do what I do. I'm in the business of helping people get ready for their last day and in between live every day between now and then in God's grace and power. And if you have forgotten, you are in the same business. What you do supports the ministry to help people get ready for their last day on this planet and to live every day between now and then in God's grace and God's power. 
Now, ministry is never tougher than not when you just got some conflict going on and you got some confusion going on, but there is something, there's a crisis in your life that personally crushes you. Now, I know most of you don't know me and you don't know my story, but just in my personal life right now, uh, it's at a time that's really joyful for us, really fulfilling, and just things, it's hard to imagine things being any better. My wife Barbara and I, we, we've had uh, quite a ride. Uh, we got married, as I said, to be 22 years ago this last January, and I was serving Central Christian Church in Vegas at the time. And, and uh, uh, when we decided to get married, uh, the, the challenge that we had was uh, when you're a pastor of a mega church, who do you invite to your wedding? And, and that was a little bit of a dilemma for us. It was either we invite nobody so we don't offend anybody, and that sure didn't seem right in this church that had walked uh, with me through such a challenging, heartbreaking time in my life, or if you invited everybody, we'd be the first wedding in history to have to have multiple services. And so <laughs> we didn't know what to do. And finally, we thought, well, we will get married. In those days, we had a big Wednesday night service. I said, why don't we just get married at our Wednesday night service? We just won't tell people they're coming to our wedding. Who's ever there gets to be a part of it. Who's ever not there, you know? And, we, and so that's what we did. So we had a Wednesday night service. We had, we had big worship time that night. We had some baptisms and things like that. And then some of you might know who Mike Bro is. Mike's one of my closest friends. And Mike was scheduled to preach that night. And Mike got up and he said, I know I'm supposed to teach right now. He said, but instead I have two major announcements to make. He said, number one, Gene Apple and Barbara Callen are engaged. And everybody said, oh, that's wonderful. Our poor pastor's been so pitiful around here the last few years. We, we are so happy for him. And then he said, the second major announcement is, you're at their wedding. They didn't applaud. They were kind of gasped, and I think people thought he was kidding because we were always kidding, and uh, until family members who had flown in from all over the country <coughs> started walking in from this side of the room, that side of the room, sat down in the front row, and we had a wedding at church that night. And uh, I told people the moral of the story is you never want to miss a midweek service. <laughs> and uh, I, I had people saying to me, I can't believe it. That's the only night I ever missed. I was like, yeah, right. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure that's, that's true. So Barbara and I have had quite a ride when she got, we got married. She had an 11-year-old son that I had the privilege of adopting. He got married this summer, and we have two daughters who are now uh, both in college, and uh, just the uh, youngest one started her freshman year of college. We're empty nesters. For the first time in our lives, because uh, we were a family from day one that we got married, it, it's just us. It's just Barbara and I. We've never had that before in our, our, our relationship or marriage. So it's a tremendously joyful time for us, but... It's so joyful that sometimes it's hard to remember that it's not always been that way. One of the good things about God's grace is sometimes he gives us a graceful sense of forgetfulness about the past and how difficult it really was. And uh, there was a time in my life in ministry where it was really tough. And I want to tell you a couple of the things that I learned in that time. One is during that time, you've got to allow God to work in you. Allow God to work in you. You know, going through times where you're personally crushed is one of the greatest schools of higher education that we ever go through. I mean, one of the things that I learned during that time is that when you lose everything that you have and you still have Jesus, and I thought I had lost everything. I mean, I was a pastor going through a marriage breakdown. Who's going to, you know, I resigned three times that next year, and her elders kept holding on to me. And, and uh, when you lose everything, and you still have Jesus, I learned that he's enough. And, you know, I've never forgotten that. I thought I'd lost everything. And now when, you know, things heat up or go through a crisis, I just remember back that time, hey, I know what it's like to feel like I've lost everything, and I had Jesus, and he was enough, and that gives me peace. One of the greatest things I learned during that time was uh, a heart for people who are hurting, who are devastated, who are lonely, I hope God used that to make me into a different kind of pastor and a leader. I'll never forget my first Christmas alone again. Uh, I had intended to, uh, after the Christmas Eve services, to go through a drive through grab something to eat, go home, do some laundry and pack, and I was going to catch a flight back here to the Midwest to spend Christmas Day with 20 members of my family. And I got away from the church after our last Christmas Eve service. I think it was around 9.30 that night, and I hadn't eaten since the middle of the day, and I was hungry, and so I ran down the street to a little chicken drive through place, and they were closed. And so I went right next door with a taco drive through place, and they were closed. And uh, so I finally drove over to Jack in the Box. I was really getting desperate. And uh, Jack in the Box was closed. 
And uh, so then I thought, well, I'll go to my supermarket. Las Vegas supermarket's open 24 hours a day. I'll just go there and I'll get something. I go to my supermarket. The supermarket was closed. And now I'm starting to get depressed, you know, having a little pity party for myself. Oh, it's Christmas Eve for me all by myself, thinking about families, having all their little gatherings and everything. And, and, uh, but I was determined to find something to eat. So I drove out to the eastern edge of Las Vegas. There's a country western themed casino out there called Sam's Town. And uh, when I pulled up, I was surprised. The place was hopping. Parking lot was full. I walked inside. There was people playing the slot machines and video poker machines and all the table games and everything. And I went upstairs to a second-story diner there called Mary's Diner, sat down at a table for four all by myself. And I thought, I can't believe it. I just spoke for thousands of people. And here I am at Sam's Town on Christmas Eve eating the blue plate special of meatloaf and mashed potatoes and gravy alone. And just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, somebody put a quarter in the jukebox and Elvis started singing in my ear, Are you lonesome tonight? <laughs> Absolutely true. And your sympathy is very touching to me, by the way. I think <laughs> I, I knew those IT people had a lot of, lot of uh, empathy in them, you know. And uh, actually, I started uh, laughing, probably to keep from crying. And the thought that just overwhelmed me was, Gene, here you are, one of the most blessed guys in the world. You got a church family that loves you. You've got more close friends than should be legally allowed to have. You're flying home in the morning to spend Christmas Day with 20 members of your family. And if you of all people can be lonely tonight, imagine how difficult this night is for those who don't have anybody. And I walked out of the casino that night, and I'm telling you, I'm watching all these people in the casino playing all the different games, and it was like the Holy Spirit just sent a dart right into my soul with the message that said, they don't have anywhere else to go tonight either. Why else would they be here on Christmas Eve? I don't know that I would have developed a heart for people dealing with that kind of stuff without going through my own personal pain. Allow God to work in you. What does he need to do in you that he couldn't do in any other way? And then the other thing I would say when you're going through that time, allow God to work through you. So, you know, some of us think that when we go through a personal crisis of some kind, that God just puts us on the shelf and he can't use us anymore and, and all those kinds of things. But friends, oftentimes when we're weak, when we're crushed, when we're broken, that's when able, God's able to do his greatest work through us because people see, well, that's just God working in them. I mean, during that time, it was... Uh, that I was going through that, it was so tough, like for the next couple of years, just to be able to stand up and teach on a weekend. It took everything within me. I, I barely could do anything else in my life. But you know what? God used me in spite of my weaknesses. And I learned that if God energizes my spiritual gifts when I'm weak, then he is really the one who energizes my gifts when I think I'm strong. And I learned what the Apostle Paul meant when he had this thing that crushed him, that, that he prayed that God would remove three times from his life, and God didn't, and instead God came to him and said, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul, because my power is made perfect in weakness. While God is working in you, and some of you probably are going through some stuff, tough stuff right now, and maybe nobody else in this room even knows you're going through it, remember he can still work you. Any of you uh, like to fish? Any fisher people in the room? Good number of you. I like to fish. And uh, when we're up in northern Minnesota at our cabin, I've got a favorite fishing spot that I'd, uh, I like to go to, and I'll close with this. Um, it, it, to get there, you really have to want to get there. It's about 20 miles from our cabin. And so we have to trailer our fishing boat, and we drive 20 miles. And, and this lake that I like to fish on, you can't even launch a boat on the lake. You have to launch on another lake. And then you have to motor across this first lake. And you go across this first lake, there's a lot of homes around the lake. You'll always see a lot of activity, a lot of boats, people fishing, water skiing, things like that. And then you come to uh, a channel. And the channel is about like the width of a double doorway. And on each side of it is uh, lily pads and walls of white birch tree. It's about the length of a football field. And uh, when you get to the channel, you have to slow down, and uh, then uh, partway through the channel, you have to lift your motor a little bit because it's so shallow. You have to putz through the channel, kind of that, to keep your motor from hitting the bottom. Then it gets so shallow at one point, you have to lift your entire motor, and, um, 
and, and then you get out your oars and you row through. And then the last 50 feet of the channel, the bottom of the boat starts hitting the channel. And at that point, my wife and kids have to get out and pull me through the last 50 feet. And uh, no, we all get out of the boat and we pull the boat through. But on the other side of that channel uh, is one of the most beautiful lakes I have ever seen in my life. Uh, I've seen deer come down and drink out of the side of the water. I've seen eagles fly overhead. Uh, there's only a couple cabins on that lake. I've never seen more than two or three boats back there at any given time. But the fishing is just incredible. I mean, over the years, we have brought home basketfuls of fish from that lake. And the question may come up in your mind, well, Gene, if it's such a beautiful lake, if it's so fantastic, if the fishing is so great, why aren't there more boats back there fishing? Why, why are there only, you know, like two or three or four boats back there? And the answer is very simple. It just takes so much work to get there. You got to trailer your boat. You got to drive 20 miles. You got to launch on another lake. You got to motor across that first lake. You got to enter the channel. You got to slow way down. You got to lift your motor and you got to putz through that channel part of the way. And then you got to get out your oars and, and you got to row through the channel. And then you got to put the oars in the boat and, and, and get get out of the boat, you have to portage the boat, and you have to carry it through. It just takes so much work to get there. But only those who are willing to enter the channel experience the better fishing on the other side. At the end of the day, we are in the fishing business. We're fishing for men and women who matter to God. And you can't experience the better fishing without going through the channel of change. And I hope you'll be a little more savvy about some of the mistakes you can avoid moving forward. And I hope God will give you courage to stay strong during conflict, give you clarity when you're in confusion, why you do what you do, and keep you close to Him when you're going through a personal crisis that crushes you because there's better fishing on the other side. And here's what I would say to you. You know, some of you going through change right now, leading through change. The Bible says, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Let's bow our heads together. You know, I don't know what's potentially tough for you right now, and maybe nothing that I've talked about is relevant to your world today, or maybe there's one or two or three things that have connected with you. Some of you maybe right now have some conflict going on. Uh, maybe it's with a leader, a friend, a church staff member, a colleague, a pastor. Maybe it's someone who's even with you this week on your team. And there's been some unkind words said. Maybe today you just need to pray, God, help me to guard my overreactions. Maybe you haven't. Maybe there's an apology that needs to be extended. Maybe you just need to go to somebody humbly and say, hey, I blew it. I'm sorry. Forgive me. You know, our relationship is important to me. Some of you, you know, get lost in the technology of everything that you do, and maybe you have forgotten why you do what you do, and you lose a little courage. Remember at the end of the day, your ministry is helping people get ready for their last day on this planet and to live every day between now and then in the power and grace of Jesus Christ. Some of you going through a tough time right now, would you allow God to work in you? Would you just say, God, do in me what you couldn't have done in any other way? Help me to learn what you want me to learn. And maybe you could just say, God, work through me. May I be a more seasoned, sensitive kind of servant that you can use because I've been broken in some of the right places that you can use. God, I thank you for these men and women. I thank you for their leadership. I thank you for the way you've gifted them, that you've wired them. I thank you for the ministries and the churches to which you've called them to. God, may they have an affirmation in their spirit today that says, when nobody else notices, 
I can put my head on the pillow each night and know that there is a God in heaven looking down on me saying, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. And I ask all these things now in Jesus' name and for his sake. And everybody said, amen. Thank you, everybody. Great to be with you today.